we'll move today from the from the from the general to the specific. I will take part of the I will take uh, responsibility for the general, and then uh, Professor Boat will be will, will present a case study. So here we go. Um, when speaking about early modern Japan, we refer to the years between 1600 and 1868. During these years, Japan was a feudal society with a warrior nobility, the samurai, consisting of lords and vassals, and about 300 fiefs. Highest ranking among the samurai was the shogun who resided in Edo, present-day Tokyo. Significantly, it was a time of uninterrupted peace, characterized by profound social change. When talking about education and intellectual interaction in Japan at that time, we should keep a few very important factors in mind. First of all, there were no universities in early modern Japan. One could not study at a university and one could not pursue a university career. Secondly, administration, policing and jurisdiction were in the hands of the samurai class. Commoners could neither pursue a career as a civil servant or choose a legal profession. Thirdly, there were no college, religious colleges or seminaries. The Shinto priesthood was a hereditary position and therefore not open to everyone. And training for the Buddhist priesthood and subsequent careers would be a matter of the various sects and temples themselves. And finally, despite a flourishing market for printed material, pre-modern Japan had no newspaper culture. Nevertheless, within this rapidly urbanizing society, there was an enormous demand for education and knowledge. Literacy and numeracy were indispensable for commerce. And as society became more literate and more urbanized, and people discovered the joys and advantages of reading books, scholarship, literature, and art increasingly came to be seen as worthy ways to make a living and as a means of self-cultivation and enhancement of social standing. And of course, there were plenty of people who wished to pursue scholarship and art for its own sake. The result of all this was the emergence of what we might call an intellectual market, where education was business, and scholarship, literature, and art were commodities. This market was vibrant and thriving, and personal interaction was both a characteristic of and a condition for its prosperity. It was the personal rapport, the interest, inspired by the other's approach to a certain field, that brought people together as colleagues and competitors, as patrons and clients, as employers and employees, and as teachers and pupils. This was very much a world of reputation, recommendation and invitation, a market that operated on a direct and personal level. Intellectual networks were therefore of prime importance. My own research on this subject has shown that many of the factors that are usually of influence in the formation of personal networks do not apply here. Age, a common region of origin, a common teacher or matters of status and social background, background appear to have been of little influence interaction between intellectuals as intellectuals was the only thing that really mattered. Now, one way to make a living from one's intellectual achievements was to start an academy. Since there were no official rules regarding examinations and curricula, teachers could, teachers could offer what they liked 
and be flexible. Academies could be quite modest, but also large and prestigious. They might offer tuition in, for instance, the Chinese classics and Chinese poetry, Japanese literature and linguistics, medicine and botany, and Western studies based on information acquired through the Dutch factory at Nagasaki. Artistic tuition usually took the form of an apprenticeship, but of course, no artist would hesitate to accept a student who did not wish to pursue a professional career, but merely wanted to paint or to play music for pleasure. Naturally, this also, also held true for the more scholarly pursuits. Academy owners would be happy to receive non-professional students and to allow them to take part in regular classes or to give them private tuition. Teaching, on the other hand, was not a clear-cut profession. Anyone could teach, and anyone who had a good reputation would attract students. A greengrocer, for instance, could supplement his income by teaching music. A physician might teach haiku poetry in his spare time. It does not take much imagination to see that private academies and artist studios could be flourishing venues of intellectual interaction. Equally important were circles and societies where people met to attend lectures, discuss current issues, compose poetry together, or produce works of art for appreciation and discussion. It should be noted that in Japan, art and literature were very much seen as a collective thing, something one should engage in and enjoy with others. In recent years, it has become popular in Japan to refer to such societies as salons, but I'm not sure the term really applies. Firstly, there would never be a salonniere. The initiative would usually be with a prominent or with a particularly gregarious scholar who might even ask a subscription fee. Secondly, although meetings could be held at someone's home or someone's academy, they could also be held at a popular restaurant or take the form of an outing. Thirdly, I think these Japanese society were more genuinely egalitarian than the Parisian salons. We should keep in mind that the samurai class made up about 7% of the population, whereas the French aristocracy amounted to about 1%. Although they would know their place, in general, the Japanese were quite used to interacting with samurai. It was mainly the small imperial court aristocracy who took an elitist stance and kept aloof, although there were notable exceptions to this too. Intellectual interaction also meant travel. Within Japan, that is, the Japanese were not allowed to travel abroad. Students traveled to the teacher of their choice, colleagues visited each other, Artists traveled to carry out commissions, and intellectuals of every kind traveled to benefit from private collections of books and manuscripts, artifacts or natural objects, or to study the collections of temples and shrines. Most academies were situated in the urban centers. Edo, the shogunal capital, Kyoto, the emperor's residence, and the harbor town of Nagasaki were notable academic hubs. Not only people traveled up and down the country, letters did so too. Moreover, teaching through correspondence was common practice for teachers of, for instance, poetry and calligraphy. There was, however, very little interaction with people 
any people, not only intellectuals, from the outside world. Some were irregular visits by Korean envoys, the Chinese community in Nagasaki, and the inhabitants of the Dutch factory and their Japanese interpreters pro provided what little contact there was. Although contact with the Dutch was restricted, it was hugely influential for the development of science in Japan. Women were very much part of it all. Like their male counterparts, female scholars and women of letters taught and published books, and female artists sold their work. Women did take part in gatherings and groups, but not as much as men. This does not necessarily mean they were not welcome. They may themselves have thought their presence was somehow unseemly, or their husbands or parents may have done so. Within the available sources, however, women are often hard to pinpoint. Apart from a few well-known and much admired female scholars, poets and artists, erudite women usually do not have an identity of their own. We find them in the biographies of erudite men, the mother of Mr. A, who also wrote poetry, the sister of Mr. B, who was also a fine painter, the daughter of Mr. C, who helped her father with his manuscript, the wife of Mr. D, who was an assistant teacher at his academy. When trying to find women in lists of contributors to poetry collections, for instance, it does not help that in Japan, it was common to use a literary or artistic alias, consisting of fanciful characters that say little about the user's gender. There is still much to learn and to discover about the role of women on the intellectual market. So far, well, my contribution, Dirk had promised you a republic, I have given you a market. I hope it offers a new aspect, a new perspective. And I would now like to give the floor or the screen to uh, Bimboat. Thank you very much. Uh, I will focus in my lecture on the ethos of one particular group of intellectuals operating in this market, namely the specialists in Chinese studies. Next slide. Kangaksha, also known as Confucians. Confucian scholars taught classical Chinese, Kangaku, Chinese studies, which in those days was the most highly regarded specialization. Why? Because, one, Chinese gave access to the highest culture within the East Asian cultural sphere. Second, anyone aspiring to the title of intellectual had to be able to read and write Chinese, or at least to produce the occasional Chinese pro poem. And the only profession in Japan, apart from teacher at the private academy, was physician. The private academy, Juku, was physician. Physicians had their own Chinese medical classics, so they had to learn Chinese or to be able to read them. And they learned their Chinese in the Kangaku Juku before moving on to an Igaku Juku uh, to study medicine proper. And therefore, you very often find a combination of Confucian and physician, Jui. Of course, Confucian scholars too competed with each other. They had to, for they were living by their wits. However, they had to maintain a certain decorum, and that's important. Why? Because basically, they were custodians of the Confucian corpus, the, the, the Chinese classics. And within the East Asian cultural sphere, the Confucian classics contained the truth about men and society and were the model for poetry and prose. If not the Holy Bible, the classics were at least a set of highly revered canonical texts. This had certain implications for the Confucian scholars who expounded the classics. It would not do for them to be seen quarreling in the streets over the interpretation of the classics, because that would give the impressions that the classics were debatable. Their main task was humbly to explain the classics, 
and make them accessible through instruction, annotation, translation, application, and through the creation of research aids such as dictionaries. If they had any new and original interpretations of the classics, the safest way was to bring it not as their own new discovery, but as a rediscovery of the original meaning of the classics. It has always been there and I just humbly discovered it. If they happened to disagree amongst themselves, if they engaged in polemics, they did so in classical Chinese, which was inaccessible to the masses. All these points emerge when we compare two important Confucians. Next slide, please. Uh, of you, Sorai and Minawa Kien. Of the two, Sorai was and still is better known. The reason is that Sorai was controversial. Controversial because he openly broke with many of the standard interpretations of the classics. He was also notorious because he saw the classics as a practical guide for governing the realm that was left to us by the ancient sages. And he disregarded the element of individual ethical self-cultivation. This element he claimed had been inserted into the interpretation of the classics by the Neo-Confucian scholars of the Sun dynasty, foremost among whom was Zhu Xi. This Neo-Confucianism had also become the reigning orthodoxy in the Edo period. So Sorai was very much protesting against the general assumptions. The emphasis he placed on the practical element of the classics as a guide for governing the realm, no doubt had to do with the fact that Sorai was a samurai and samurai are born to rule. Like many others, Kien, who was a mere commoner, disagreed with Sorai, but the way in which he engaged with Sorai was not through overt polemics, but through writing a number of books on the same pattern as books by Sorai, by beating him on his own turf, so to say. And he did so while all the time adhering to orthodox neo-Confucianism. Uh, these books are, next slide, uh, Monga Kyoyo, which can be paired off with Sorai's Gakusoku. The next set is Meichu, which can be paired off with Sorai's Bendo and Benmei. And the third set is Kian's Kien Toyo, which can be paired off with Sorai's Sorai Sensei to Monsho. The first two sets are books in Kanbun and the last in Japanese. In Mongla Kyoyo, Kian attempts to integrate the philological method of interpreting, interpreting the classics with the ethical element of self-cultivation, which is very, it's a very interesting exercise. Sorai, on the other hand, in Gakustoku, basically just says that there is only one method to reach a correct understanding of the text, and that method, method is sit down, read on until you understand. Um, Meichu is an explanation of important Confucian terminology arranged in a lexical format. Kian tries to surpass Sorai by claiming that he has been able to reconstruct the actual sound of the words used by the ancient sages when they spoke their, the texts that later became the classics, while Sorai merely relies on the characters which were created many years, many centuries after the sages lived. Next slide. Uh, appropriately, Kian's method is called kaibutsugaku, the opening of things, and the things in this case are the sounds of the, word, of the words. Well, Sorai's method is known as komonjigaku, which is based on reconstruction, the ancient meaning of characters, of words as characters in their original context. I hardly need to point out that Kian's reconstruction of the sounds of ancient Chinese is highly debatable. Uh, anyway, meaning and sound are two different things. To try, as Kian does, to reconstruct the meaning from the sound is a non-starter. Um, apart from this, however, Meichu is worth reading, and it is a pity that nobody does. 
Uh, Monchu and Toyo are simplified explanations of Confu Confucian doctrine and practice written in the vernacular. So they were intended for a general readership. But pro forma, Sorai's letters were addressed to a couple of samurai, while Kien's letters are addressed to a daimyo. And that is one up for Kien, of course, but because the daimyo is the lord of many samurai. So in this discussion, no angry word was said, but for those who could put two and two together, Kian's message was clear. Essential to the whole enterprise of teaching Chinese was publishing. If you wanted students, you had to know, you had to be known. So it was not quite publish or perish, but it came, came close. The way I reconstruct the field, and that is my hypothesis, uh, books were written in books written in Japanese in one of the two syllabic scripts you can use for writing Japanese interspersed with, interspersed with characters would sell. Publishers were willing to publish these Japanese books at their own risk. Which of the two syllabic scripts one used was an indication of the character of the book. The script called hiragana argued frivolity while katakana indicated that the book was serious and intended to enlighten its readers. However, books in Kanbun in classical Chinese with only Chinese characters were very, very serious indeed, and therefore difficult to sell. Therefore, a publisher would hold such, such publications to be subsidized. Unfortunately, what the Confucian masters wanted to publish was classical Chinese, Kampun. This was the language they taught and which they used when writing for peers. Sometimes in exegetical works they intended for the uninitiated, they stoop to katakana, but never to hiragana. In other words, commercially speaking, they had a problem and they needed subsidies in order to publish their writings. And where could these subsidies come from? either from patrons or from their present and former students. For instance, the publication of Kien's Meichu, six fascicles of Dan's Kambun, was paid for by one of his daimyo patrons. The situation became especially urgent when the work to be published was the master's Bunshu. What is the Bunshu? A bunshu is a collection of the master's Chinese poetry and shorted pieces, pieces in prose in Chinese. No Japanese was included. Both the poems and the prose are arranged by genre and within the genre in a chronolog chronological order. Most poems and short pieces and all of the letters included in a bunshu are addressed to somebody and generally bear a date. For us as scholars of a later generation, the Bunshu are a great help in tracing the network of its author, but for those who had to see them published, they were an onerous burden. Lots of work and begging for money. The custom to compile Bunshu began with Chushi, and once Confucianism had established itself in Japan, all self-respected Confucian scholars wanted to have one. Uh, his bunshu was the medium through which a Confucian scholar presented himself to pos posterity. The drill was that bunshu be compiled posthumously by grateful sons and disciples and that biographical information be attached. For practical purposes, the first one to have one was Hayashi Razan. His bunshu was compiled by his sons and published in 1662 in twice 75 fascicles with a number of appendices, including both a chronological overview of his life in Nempu and a laudatory biography in Gyojo. Razan's son, Hayashi Gaho, doubled his father's score. His bunshu counted twice 150 fascicles, so the double of his father's. The Hayashi could do this because they were in the hereditary employ of the Bakfu. They had a steady income and a huge network among the rulers of the realm. Both in Kian's case and in Sorai's case, however, things went wrong. Kian has two bunshu, the first one of which was published during his lifetime in installments, and in 1792, three fascicles of poetry, 1799, three fascicles of prose, six fascicles in all, which is neg negligible if you compare it with the score of the Hayashi. <clears throat> 
And the editing was done by his son, three of his students, and the books were printed as woodblock prints and put on the market in Kyoto and in uh, Osaka and Edo. After his death, a second compilation was made, edited by Ki and Son alone. In some respects, it was an improvement. It was 15 fascicles instead of six, and it had two prefaces written by arist aristocrats of the imperial court. However, it was not a decent woodblock, woodblock print, but it was printed in movable type, which is the Japanese equivalent of offset. No printer's name, no dating, etc. Dating is based on the preface 1816, 19, nine years after Kian's death. Something similar happened to Sorai's Bunshu. His Sorai Shu was published in three installments 7035 poetry, 7037 prose, 7040 letters, with two different publishers. It did not contain any biographies, only one preface. The preface was dated summer of 1736. And it was written by the daimyo Honda Tadamune, who was one of Sorai's later disciples. And probably Tadamune paid for the publishing, as he also probably paid for the stone on Sorai's grave, which he inscribed himself. In both cases, we are confronted with a lack of organization of manpower, which will have been due to a lack of patronage and hence of money. Basically, with the deaths of Sorai and Kien, their schools collapsed, their networks of patrons and disciples evaporated, and with these went the money. Among other things, this confronts, confronts us with the fact that Juku did not outlast their founder. I only know of two exceptions in the whole of the adult period. In other words, the competition was heavy, the turnover was swift, and even among the representatives of the most highly regarded specialization, things were not easy. Thank you.